head cases. Check out all our socials and also go to our merch store. We have a lot of cool stuff up there. The links are below. Please check it out and buy something for fuck's sake. We need the money, please. Hey, everybody. This is Michael Cerevolo, curator of Beauty and Chaos and CEO of Schechter Guitar. You're listening to the Voices in My Head podcast. that I kind of do some of the writing in. We have a another studio that has two rooms. I mean, nothing really fancy, but it's nice to be able to get the cabinets and, and stuff out of the room. Uh, gotcha. But, yeah, having a second room to be able to uh, do reamping or just straight tracking without having the actual cabs there. Yeah, there's enough space in between the rooms, and uh, it, it's actually at the Schechter warehouse so we actually have the giant custom shop that we run snakes to and actually track oh them. hell yeah we track so in there so it's probably one of the biggest recording rooms in the world <laughs> <laughs> so i gotta ask so do you have the heads in the room with you and like it's all mic'd up in the other room so i'm assuming you got the heads in with you so you can make minor adjustments without having to run from one side of the warehouse to the other yeah, well, the the studio's in like the lobby part. There's a couple of rooms in there, so we it's it's probably like a twelve by fifteen room. That's a control room, and then there's a stairwell that goes upstairs. So there's that four or five feet of space in between the other room. So it's we we kind of have that room snaked. That's where the cabinets sit uh, in more of a controlled room. But then we just drag a, a snake out of the control room down the hallway into the. Uh, the big room, which is, I don't know, it's got, I know it's got like, it's two stories. So there's probably 50 foot ceilings and, uh, kind of all kind of weirdly reflect reflective spaces. So, uh, not a lot of, uh, we don't need a lot of reverb. Uh, no, <laughs> no not unless you want to take a 421 and move it like 20 feet back away oh, from the cab. Well, Roson's, I mean, we usually do the, the guitars close up. Uh, usually that room is where we end up doing the drums. Uh, he usually mics, uh, I don't know, we were doing um, a 212 Orange last night, and it, I forgot Ooh. what he had. Probably a Royer uh, ribbon and I think a 421 on it. He, he's the tech guy when it comes to it. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, you guys have great tones, like God, especially the clean tones. Those are really nice. Are you using Strymon? Uh, I, ha- I definitely have some Strymon pedals. Uh, a lot of the clean stuff is just... Uh, what do we use in amp wise? I have a, a couple of deluxe reverbs, uh, quite a few um, Supro amps that are really clean. And then we, I also have a really nice uh, JC120 uh, that we'll use for clean tones also. Yeah, and that that JC120, if I'm not if I'm correct, that's a solid state, right? Yeah, but that that's probably one. I mean, that's the typical or atypical 80s clean amp. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, those sound really good. I heard they're really heavy. Yeah, well, mine gets even heavier because I've replaced the stock speakers with EVs, so uh, it's a <laughs> it's it's a two person move on it. Uh, <laughs> oh no, it's sitting in a uh, a road case, so the the wheels it's it can roll around. But uh, gotcha, so you got casters on it. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, shoot. We should probably uh, hop right into this. Um, I see we're already recording. Uh, I think yep. I, think I went ahead guys, and jumped in and hit the recording button. So <laughs> I think these guys do the intro after the fact, after the interview and all that. But um, I'm just going to throw one out there for those of you who don't know. And William, let's edit this. So I've been I've been pronouncing it Cerevolo. Is it Cerevolo? Yeah, Cerevolo. But that's Cervolo. the first one was a lot closer than I've had throughout high school and school. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a nice Italian name that gets slaughtered, but that's okay. Oh, Italian! I'm a bit Italian myself. Mother's maiden name is Constantino. Oh wow! Yeah, we go back to Sicily together. Oh, just uh, went was in Minneapolis. Went to a place called Little Italy. It's a whole block. And they've got like fine dining upstairs on like the rooftops. They've got markets, like all the stuff. Oh, so good. So if you're ever in the Minneapolis area, St. Paul, head oh, up Little man. Italy. Absolutely love it. But uh, Servolo, right? Yep. Servolo. You're good. Servolo. All right. All right. I'll answer. So, 
<laughs> All right, I'm going to try to get a little intro out here for us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, for those listening today, we have Michael Cervolo of Beauty and Chaos, also CEO of Schecter Guitars. Michael, an absolute pleasure to have you on today. How are you doing? Good, man. Thank you guys for taking the time on Sunday to do this. Absolutely. Thanks for giving Thanks. us the time. Oh, of yeah, we know you're a pretty busy man. So uh, my co-host here is uh, William Grone. Yep. He is the owner of Basement Productions, and he's uh, going on tour with us as a photographer. Oh, fantastic. He does uh, does a lot of national acts. I'm pretty sure he's photographed so many Schachters up on stage. I did actually just last week at the Helium Prime show. Chris Radke was playing a Schechter. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> and yeah. I have a Schechter in my background right behind me here. Oh, nice. I got a couple laying around here. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do love that hollow body Corsair that you got. Is that like your, I know it's not a signature signature, but is that like your favorite? The one I, that you use? Yeah, I've been, uh, God, I think I, I think I have five or six of them. Actually, I think I just gave one to my friend, Taro Bates, who's going out. He produced a new Manson record and he's going out and he needed, uh, we don't do a hard, uh, tunematic version anymore. So I gave him my, hardtail version but i think i have five corsairs that i'll just have a little bit different pickups but yeah i over the years kind of started migrating to that guitar where you can kind of control feedback uh you know the the having being able to split uh -oh. the two pickups to me mm -hmm. is, is really cool uh to get some definitely for the cleaner stuff and i've grown to really like bigsby tremolos Gotcha. That's one one of the tremolos I do not have any experience with yet. Very subtle. Uh, you know, they're not the 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 when you you press down, strings will go in different uh, pitches. Uh, so it's like a subtle trim, uh, but it just something I've I've kind of grown attached to and becomes a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed the uh, the subtle. The subtle bombs, well, I guess they're not bombs, but the subtlety of the uh, tremolo and some of the stuff, it sounds really good. Like I say, uh, the clean stuff on your guys' records, especially this new one, Dancing with Angels, man, you've you really knocked it out of the park with that vibe. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've picked up, like, one of my favorite guitar players is uh, Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine, and he's always done this thing where he'll hit a chord – but with the bar depressed slightly, so it's like slightly out of pitch, and then comes up to pitch. So it he he, if you ever watch interviews, he ex, he's has this like physiological explanation of what it does to the brain when you hear a, 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 hear a sound that's slightly out and back in pitch. Uh, and a, it's ear candy; it'll catch you and make you yeah. think. Wait, what was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when it's run through a, a ton of other stuff, it it becomes pretty ethereal. Mm hmm. So I'm we're going to go through a signal chain here just because I really like the clean tone. And anyone who's heard anything off the album, I, it's not out yet, is it? No, it came out uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. I know I got the sound. We got the SoundCloud uh, link to it, but um, I was I was searching for it on YouTube music just uh, down here while we were getting ready and stuff like that. Dude, give it another good listen through. And I'm like, oh, I can't find it. I you guys think I opted it. We opted not to have it on YouTube music only because it looks strange when you have videos and then they'll have just a song next to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm not a big streaming fan. Uh, I get the convenience of it, but to me, it makes music become just background and people end up. Uh, I think it, it lessens the value of the art of making music when people it's like, oh, I just I'll stream it. And then they I think they're missing out on actual having physical music. But that's just me and my soapbox. <laughs> nah, nah, there there is something about having a physical disc in your hand or a physical vinyl um, back in the day when we used to be able to buy these things, especially at merch tables you'd always get such cool artwork within like the little booklets and stuff that you get when you get the physical copies of these things and yeah. uh, streaming streaming I, has kind of taken away from that. They, they, it's, it's lost that, you know, element and it's a romantic notion, but yeah, the CD, our CD has a 12 page booklet. It has all these little musical interludes that tie the songs together. Uh, 
And mm-hmm. I, I think I, f- I find that people who actually will purchase and own physical music probably have a better listening environment to to hear it on. You know, they if you buy vinyl, you, you probably have a nice stereo that at least has some stereo spread in the speakers. And <laughs> it's kind of how, you know, I think it, it's mixed to, you know, for us, we mix, rec- we mix it to hear on vinyl and CD on a stereo, not not on one of these things. And I find that people that listen like that, it's like they're, I think they're missing so much uh, of, of the music, the parts that are in there. But right. And uh, I will say the uh, the interlude songs, the halos, those are uh, those are a really nice touch to help uh, prep them. You for the next one. I appreciate that. I think some people might look at them as self-indulgent, but, you know, I mean, I guess it is to a certain extent, but I I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, listening to something in order. You know, we spent a lot of time with the the track running order, why one song should go into the next. And uh, to me, it just made it a an experience, you know, I, I, again, the romantic notion of someone giving, you know, 75 minutes to an uninterrupted listen is probably, you know, not going to happen. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we don't try. It, I absolutely feel that. I mean, it is nice. I'm not going to lie. The first time I listened to it, I was on route. It was a really long day at work and uh, we were actually going through a duress show. And uh, I'm sitting here listening to uh, Diving for Pearls while the storm's coming all around me <laughs> in my FedEx truck. Because <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I do for the day job stuff. Unfortunately, I'm stuck running around the uh, city of Bettendorf like a chicken with his head cut off. But at least that gives me a lot of time to listen to the music uninterrupted while still being somewhat productive. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I think people in this new TikTok world want want just a hook you know and then it's on to the next and i don't think they absorb music the way uh it used to be i think every generation always feels theirs is better but i don't think anybody is necessarily going to be looking at the the 2000s like the same way they've looked at the 60s 70s and 80s in music you know uh right because things have become so much more accessible um you you how many times do people sit there and skip through a song before they're like oh i already know this one i'm gonna listen to it and i that's we we uh i'm a millennial i just turned 30 this year and uh we call that TikTok brain yeah it's uh you know it's, people don't have the attention span i mean there's lots of times i'll watch our daughters and we, you know, what's on TV, 500 channels, and they still can't find something to watch. It's, uh, mm-hmm. and, and I watch how they listen to music. They'll, she'll hear a song, you know, I'll be driving in her Jeep with her and she's listening to it, singing, and then skips halfway through. I went, do you, just my science experiment, do you not like the song? Oh, no, I love it. Well, why do you skip it? Oh, I just, uh, I saw what was coming next. And it, it's, it's a strange uh, strange world i think <laughs> uh, i'm the exact opposite I, I will sit there and listen to a song five times in a row just because that part's coming up again huh. yeah. yeah or didn't make me feel like a hero enough the first time i listened to it so i'll listen to it again <laughs> <laughs> it didn't hit right the first time i mean it hit it hit awesome but it didn't hit right the second time or third time the fourth time maybe nope i'm just needing an excuse to listen to something new again because uh like the way I listen to music, I have to listen to it multiple times to like digest it all well, and then build up the structure. You, yeah, I think you hear different, uh, you know, songs that are well orchestrated and there there are parts and maybe something that's not meant to be a main part. I think you hear it and each time you listen to it, maybe you hear something different in it. Mm. Oh, I didn't notice that you know, there was this little, this sound or this thing going on in the background. And, you know, I, I'm blessed to have Michael Rose on as my partner in this. And there is a lot of things front to back as well as left to right that I think uh, a single listen, you, you might miss it or, you know, right. listening on a mono or this faux stereo iPhone that's sitting on your desk or something. Uh See, like I, I listened to it the uh, second and third time through on a set of KRK Rocket third gen eights, oh, yeah. and uh, 
and just while I'm doing work, you know, it's like, that's what I love to do is I like to put on music to listen to while I'm working. And I kind of work to the tempo of that. And like, even on a song like devil, you know, that song got, it's got a lot of open space because I, I typically listen to a lot of metal. So a lot of it's super congested, but when you sit back and listen to something with some space in it for the first time, you're like, Oh, that's nice. And you listen to it again. You're like, I didn't catch that the first time around. What was mm-hmm. that? And then the third time you're like, oh, wow. So it's it feels like there's a lot of open space, but the extra space that usually would be taken up by overdriven guitars or heavy synth samples or keys, you can hear subtleties in there. And I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty tasteful. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, shit, some of these songs have upwards of well over 100 tracks. You know, I mean, Pro Tools is the ul- ultimate enabler. It keeps giving. <laughs> you know, uh, it, and so, you know, if if that can be overdone and it could can just be cluttered. But uh, again, one benefit working with Roson is that we make sure what goes down is 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 proper proper harmonically, and you know, he has a whole lot more theory uh, background than I do. Uh, but it, you know, I think, I think it works and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a cool process, uh, that we have going. And I think we've gotten better at the, at that process as each album goes along. Gotcha. That totally makes sense. And, uh, speaking of, uh, other people involved in this. So whenever I uh, go through and look, look on some of the track listing, I'm seeing a lot of different personnel on this. So. As for Beauty and Chaos, who are like the main core members, like the, the the people that have stayed there for quite well, like more semi-permanent to permanent members? Well, it's it's really, it's Michael and I, Michael Rosan and I, and then kind of a re- revolving, evolving cast of characters. I think, I mean, taking the remix uh, records aside, which have had other guitar players and, and things like that on it. I think we've had 25 singers over the four albums. I mean, a wow. couple couple have repeated. Uh, Wayne Hussey from The Mission and Ashton Knight have been on, I think, four, if not five songs each. Uh, Johnny from Human Drama has been on two. Uh, this is the second one for Cat. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an open-end policy. And some of the joy, or a lot of the joy of this, has become finding... Uh, just matching the music with the right singer. Uh, you know, I do get a lot of credit and praise, like you always find the right person. And I don't know how that happens. It's luck, divine intervention, what, whatever it is. I, you know, when, when a piece of music goes to a singer and it comes back a song, that's mm-hmm. a, that's a highlight uh, to me. And uh, somehow over four of these albums, I've never had something come back and me and Michael listen to it, and I just we just go, Ugh, they they missed it here, uh, you know. It's it's yeah. been, uh, that would be a you know because I do respect and and value everyone's time um, that puts into this, and you know we've been really fortunate that uh, these singers and lyricists have turned uh, this music into some pretty cool songs that I still listen to and enjoy. Uh, I find myself listening to our music or Beauty and Chaos different than I have anything else I've been involved in on Human Drama or Gene Loves Jezebel records. I always found myself going, okay, I'm in this and I'm listening to it like, oh, I wish I would have did different on the guitar. This should have been louder, lower, other snare drums doing this and all that stuff that you guys probably do. You know, you listen to it and you kind of hone in on something that's probably different than you do when you put on an album you like. And, uh, so, something about Beauty and Chaos has allowed me to to listen from this above view of it as a listener and not part of it, and uh, that that that's a joy. I, you know, it's probably because I'm fans of the singers on it, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't zone in on guitars or, or or stuff like that. That your your average listener wouldn't anyway you know however loud or low a guitar is that's how it is in the song you know mm-hmm. it will, it will, and you know. Like listening to your own stuff like obviously as 
as a guy who does mixes myself, um, when I, I hate absolutely working on my own stuff because I get such in my own head about, hey, this is how it should sound. This is how I hear it. So being able to take yourself out of that element and be able to listen to it from top down, especially when you're having all these different guest singers on, it almost feels like this is a collaborative effort and you're not as hyperly critical on your parts as you are enjoying the parts of the other yeah, people. That That's totally what happens with this. And uh, I, I'm really happy that that is the thing, the case. Uh, and it's again, having Rose on, do the the tedious part certainly allows me to play more and he will you know he'll work on something uh and it's just over and over and he'll go hey you know take off for 30 minutes let me let me do this uh you know you don't need to hear all this part and then come back and it just it's it sits uh so uh, having that is, is certainly uh the critical ear is, is certainly a blessing in this process Absolutely. Plus, I mean, sometimes when you sit back and work on something, you're like, oh, I hear something, have it on repeat. You could be listening to the same vocal phrase for 30 minutes. Oh, I, <laughs> I've, I've, I've sat there through those, but he, he gets it right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. all the singers are extremely happy with the way uh, what they did is, is represented. Yeah, I was That's listening to uh, your track that you do with Robin Zander drifting away a little bit ago, and man, he just knocked it out of the park robin zander is such a great vocalist yeah that was uh that was that's you know there's a lot of these surreal moments that i still uh you know forget that has happened in this so when the the, the way this whole beauty and chaos thing came about i was working we were doing a human drama album and I kind of wanted it to be more guitar i wanted to, to have a bit of a throwback to what the band was in the the 80s and johnny who the band it is really his band really just wanted it to be kind of uh what he does now it's a little slower a little more singer songwriter and i was really trying hard to inject my guitar stuff in that and it was kind of uh round peg square hole uh I mean, what what ended up happening at the end was great, but it was that moment of because Michael Rosan was tracking my guitars, and he said he could see the frustration, and he said, "Why don't you just do your own record?" And I was like, "Yeah." And then I think you then that moment comes where it's like, "All right, I just committed to that. What does that mean?" You know, I'm not a singer, uh, and uh, so the the idea of of you know, I mean, thankfully the my position at Schecter has me, you know, friends with some, you know, some pretty well-known singers and good singers. And uh, Xander uh, was the second person we brought in the studio. We brought Al Jorgensen came in and we did 20th Century Boy. And then the second person that came in was, was Robin Xander. Thankfully, he was in town. Uh, they were playing with maybe Hart and Joan Jett. And that guy came in the the day after the show, and uh, I, I've become friends with him over the year. I mean, he the the band's always treated me, my, my wife, fantastic. And then here we are, Robert Zander in that little room I was describing, and then coming into the control room, sitting down with the lyric sheets, going, "Hey, on the, well, let's hear the one he wanted to comp his three takes," and going, "What do you think of that line?" And part of me's like, you know well, one, it's really fucking cool that Xander's treating me as a contemporary. And the second thing is suddenly the kid that bought Budokan in, in color uh, going, holy shit, Xander's asking me what I think about his vocal. <laughs> and, uh, and then they get Michael Anthony to do backgrounds on that and realize that, you know, you think Cheap Trick and Van Halen and all those, you know, you know, 70s and 80s have never been on a song together. And to have Michael Anthony singing the backups to Xander uh, is, is a pretty surreal moment. <laughs> right. You know, that was just about to lead me into my next question. I mean, obviously, you're in a pretty high up position with uh, Schechter. I was that uh, affected your uh, talent pool with people you can reach out to. And you just you answer that without me even having to ask. I mean, it, it certainly helped in the beginning. Uh you know, no one, none of none of these people are going to go, oh, well, fuck, I got to sing on this because he's a checker. I mean, nobody's going to, if the, the music was garbage, I would think, 
these people would politely find a reason not to. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and say it was, it didn't help in the beginning, but thankfully with that, that first record that had some pretty, you know, I mean, diverse talents. I mean, rarely would you find a record that has Wayne Hussey from The Mission and then Ice-T on the same album. Right. I mean, go, how would these people even sit at the same dinner table they you know it's, they don't run in the same crowd but i i did know that this couldn't it would be short-lived if we just base this on who famous i could get you know right where we immediately branched out for there and and, and doing this a really long time uh I've certainly learned that fame does not equate talent and mm-hmm. someone that's less famous certainly doesn't mean less talent. Uh, mm-hmm. and, right. and this is certain, this, this has worked really well because all these artists that have come aboard and become part of our family, their fan base has migrated to us and then vice versa. So it's, it's uh, that, that joy of finding the right gem uh, you know, like in this new record, Cynthia Isabella. I mean, that, that girl's got a fantastic voice and that she did hollow. And I think if people look her up and go down what she's done with Silence in the Snow and her, her new Lost Gems project, I think it opens the door because I, I don't know if people find or how they find new music anymore. There's so much of it uh, and, you know, frankly, so much garbage uh, because it is yeah. it is easier to record now. You get a, a, you know, you can pull up loops and this and that, and you don't have to play anything, and then you put it out. Uh, so out of nine hundred ninety nine crap songs, uh, you may, there may be a gem in there, and I think that that's very easy to get overlooked. Yeah, and a lot of it's option paralysis too. Um... You got so much to choose from and some people they have a hard time branching out they'll they're listening to the same playlist that they've had since high school yeah hey, hey. i think uh, i think the statistic is after 30 people <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean i say i think it's after 30 people the studies show that people stop looking for new music or start listening to the same thing so with option paralysis of so much options that you have you can go through a bunch of shit and you'll be like oh well geez i uh, this might the juice might not be worth the squeeze on this i'm just going to keep going back to what i already know I, but uh i do think that is a testament to the quality of music from the past mm-hmm. i think there was more of a a creative element in it uh with less technology uh i think that's that was important uh you know, it. I, I don't know. I don't hear the next Cure, Depeche Mode, or, you know, it's why you still will go and still see Cheap Trick bringing people in, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. why, why those big tours of Motley Crue and Def Leppard, you know, they're not always my cup of tea, but they're still selling out big places because I think people long for uh, what they look at as a better time. And there is a downside to that. I've been to a much smaller extent on you know my my time with Gene Loves Jezebel and Human Drama that have had more success in the earlier part of their career, and then you're on stage and the 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 singer utters, "This is off of our new record," and it seems like it just <laughs> deflates the room. Uh, the crickets, yeah. And it, it it's like when you're on that side of it, you go, "Well, well, fuck," you know, you can't just be stuck in that you know if if you like this band you should support that they're actually are still attempting to do new music and right um, this is the better way to say it word it this is the next single this is the next hit like right. you gotta hype it up and stuff. <laughs> but yeah it's uh being on stage and and being on the other side of that there is a noticeable change in the room it's like suddenly it's like that's the time to hit the bathroom or the bar or something. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's kind of uh, deflating, you know, in a live situation. It sure is. I mean, there's been times where you've like, there's been shows where I played where I come in and I see like a big, nice crowd. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be awesome. And then we start playing and, you know, 
there's some shows like some of the promoters around here, they're they'll oversaturate a gig and you'll have a show going on for like four or five hours. And it's like that first big hurrah. Yeah. Look at all this, all these people. And then you start seeing them dwindle out as the night goes on. It's, it's tough. It's 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 demoralizing for sure. (laughs) I mean, that's when you should really kick it into the next gear and try to keep at least those people that are there entertained. But I mean, at the inside, you're like dying. (laughs) One thing with cheap trick, I've noticed like when they do put out new music though, I live in cheap trick land. I'm 20 minutes from Rockford you know, their home, their running grounds. <laughs> like every time they put out a new record and they're like, Hey, we got a new, we're going to play a new song off the new record. Like crowd just goes wild usually for cheap trick around here, hmm. you know, but I'm on, I'm on home field advantage here. So <laughs> I mean, like Rick One... Nielsen's getting ready to be at the opening of the new hard rock in a few weeks. So hmm. yeah, they're, they're really good people. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate to, to know them for quite a bit and they, uh, they couldn't be nicer. Yeah, I've met uh, Robin's daughter a few times, and she's really nice. And, you know, she's around in the, her bands and everything. And so, yeah, super awesome people, though. So uh, on top of uh, the talking of live shows and stuff like that, so, like, your interlude songs, songs like Halo, um, the, the Halos off this new album, when you're out there playing live, these would uh, tentatively be played. They'd be played in between the songs for, like, guitar changes and tuning sessions um i mean that was that like a double-edged sword you guys thought about uh pulling out we've we've never done a live show this is full studio uh this is you gotta change that this could go out there and do some good stuff (laughs) it it is it is you know when i started it was never it, it i never put it in that perspective so i i never looked at well how would we do this how would we do this i mean i i've thought about it over the past couple of years uh albums like going it would be a shame for this to end without ever doing it uh live i mean one thing i've always felt is that i would have to to, to do a song, it would have to be with the singer. I would never have one person sing multiple songs just, you know, because. Um, but with 25 singers, we certainly could pull enough singers uh, that do multiple songs uh, to be able to do it. It's, it's just figuring out the, the logistics, the how, when, and why. I, I would never do that in Los Angeles with this jaded crowd like – you know, that sits there with the get, can I be on the guest list? Are you going to impress me? Shit that I, I see in music here. I, I would wow. love to find some cities that, you know, I've been fortunate with human drama and, and Jezebel to play like Mexico city quite a bit. And those people just have a passion for music that I don't see in Los Angeles. And I'm not certainly not saying all of the United States, but just out here, uh, Let's just say California as a whole. Yeah, uh, it, <laughs> California as a whole could probably just fall in the ocean. <laughs> well, they're trying. Give them a few, couple hundred more years. But yeah, it it it's figuring it out. You know, I've never done anything on stage with tracks. Uh, it would take some of that for textures. It would take multiple guitar players, which is which is all fine. I know Rosan's worked a bunch on the past couple of ministry records, so he's done the stems for their live shows. So we could pull it off. It's just I think it's just stopping and, and shifting to that that mindset of okay, instead of doing another record, let's now put put the focus for the next couple of months on figuring out how to do, what to do, how to do it, and where to do it in a live situation. So it, I think Chicago, Chicago would be amazing. So many amazing venues in Chicago, especially oh, yeah. in this genre and everything. I mean, Chicago I is a best, uh, hot Nashville. Band. Nashville would be great, too. Yeah, I like maybe instead of doing uh, focusing on just the live, like if you were to do something like that, like live shows or versus the album. I'd say like a live album would be so cool. I, I've thought about trying to to find the right venue uh, that had the right visual, something old and theater esque that just seems House of Blues, yeah. House of Blues, Chicago. I, I yeah, I've House of Blues. That's, uh, that's that that's a nice venue. Uh, just having that and maybe doing trying to do two nights, different, uh, completely different set of songs 
each night and then trying to do a multi-camera either live stream or or something i i don't it's it, it's it's this romantic notion and then you're going okay so you're going to do this and you're going to stream it what on youtube you're going to make it a, a live dvd i mean most people don't even have freaking dvd players anymore so <laughs> it, it, it's figuring out how to do it uh i still enjoy playing on stage uh which kind of gets a, you know we get a little bit of it in the videos we get to to play and cut up and that's been the face of the of the project i think we try to make each video extremely different from its predecessor and the last two if you take holy ground and diving for pearls they're completely different uh visually and uh makes me long for the days of uh you know mtv 120 minutes or something i think we'd have gotten quite a bit of uh airplay or tv play on that uh so that that's kind of been a slight substitute for the the live thing but i i keep telling and, we, and michael and i and talk about it and tish and i talk about it like before this runs its course, you know, which would, wouldn't, to me, wouldn't be until it's no longer fun, uh, that we should start thinking about how to do it. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see you guys live. And plus, you can't keep all those pretty Corsairs to yourself, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I know a guy who does all the stems for his own band for backing tracks and everything. Uh, he's actually on this call <laughs> with us <laughs> currently sitting in a basement with the drum kit behind him. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's just an e-kit. <laughs> I, I would like to have it where we could pull as much as possible off live. You know, there's such that backlash of, you know, it's, it's a thing of, you know, people want stuff to sound just like the record, you know, in today's world. Yet there's, there's, have their iPhones out, not really enjoying the concert. Like, it's like, what are you filming it for? You know, is, are you going to go back and watch this? Are you going to post it? Does that, that do something for your social status? I, I don't know. But then you get some person going, Oh, that guy didn't play that bass note or there's background vocals. Of course, if there's a choir or something, you know, most bands can even bands of, you know, bigger stature and not bringing out a string section and stuff like that. So yeah. I want to keep some of the honesty by enough uh, that enough of this would be, you know, played. You know, there, there is a lot of guitar tracks on stuff, uh, you know, a lot that I would have to go back and figure out what the hell I played. <laughs> uh, like what you would be able to get, a, like with all the other guitar tracks in there, you got to pick what would be the most fun for me to play live while having the others taken on by somebody else yeah we would yep. would need at least one if not two additional guitar players and and that would be fun you know i think sitting down and and, and making it work but it's you know i've been just com coming up for air from the, the the thinking of things in term of an album you know like mm -hmm. the cover the running order the all that it's just it's it's fun it's that you know, it's it's finally done, and in in our head, we followed every album up with a remix record that we've kind of taken the tracks and just given them to a a variety of producers, remixers, DJs, artists, and going here. Do you you got the keys? Do do what you think on this, and that that's that's a cool process. Getting that email back on, hey, check it out. I've got, and it's. Mm -hmm. uh, some people just take the vocal tracks and the tempo and build songs around it. And it's, uh, to me, it's, it, it's kind of cool to hear like that interpretation. So that's pretty much what the next, the rest of this year is for Beauty and Chaos. Uh, we will probably have this remix record out before the end of the year and probably going to add one, if not two cover songs to it, just to kind of tie into what I have in my head as a title. Right, now, you, and, you got the one cover song on the new album. What what other ones are you potentially looking at? Well, we've done 20th Century Boy on the first record with Al, and then, I mean, that was one of the songs that I cut made me want to play guitar. Seeing Mark Bowen and T Rex play that on a late night TV show, and then on the remix record, we did a version with Mark's son Roland, 
singing it and that's that definitely goes high on that surreal moment uh we'll see i'm gonna keep that kind of secret to see if it worked out but w when we were in there the other night we made a pretty good progress on what uh one of the, that i want to try to put in that so we'll see if it if it comes through at some point i love when i look at my little board that i got somewhere around here like things i want to do one is doing a like Bowie pinup style, picking 10 or 12 songs that, you know, are important to you as a port, as a, a teen growing up and kind of doing our version of that. So we'll see if, if hopefully I can get to that at some point. That'd be cool. Kind of like a, this shaped my chaos kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Not a bad title. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Bill. Hey, you can but, use uh, that free and clear. <laughs> I'll record but, uh, that. <laughs> man, I got to say, though, the sound, I, I do like the sound. It's uh, it's kind of it's kind of like it's hard to explain. You guys have like this positive sounding vibe, but there's always this slight underlayer of uh, not cynicism, but there's just like this, like it could go darker every time when I'm listening to it. It's like. I know I brought this up to you before, but Akira Yamaoka, the the sound producer and the uh, guy who composed a lot of the Silent Hill stuff, like a lot of the uh, the awesome unnerving tension stuff actually came from more of the uplifting, happy stuff that they put in there. And I'm like, I can easily see Beauty and Chaos doing a soundtrack for a Silent Hill game or a movie. And, I mean, that uh, certainly interests me, that whole uh, soundtrack world uh that you know, which we really enjoy doing that with the Halos. Uh, if you if if you're really interested, go back to our second album, "The Storm Before the Calm." Uh, we we put it out as a CD, and I think it was six songs. I mean, the Beauty and Chaos songs are are you know five high five six minutes. There's no little short things, but mm -hmm. we sat there, and I'm going, okay, we still got about thirty minutes of time when we press this on a CD. So we did a 28 minute uh, title cut that went through like three different movements, which was sort of really the birth of the halos. It was in that realm, but it oh, that's cool. Kind of, kind of strangely long. But yeah, I think I mean that is part of the the title why I called this "Beauty in Chaos." I think there are in what we write there are definitely the beautiful ethereal elements but there's always that element of chaos you know whether it's maybe it's not even obvious but there's some dissonance there's underlying uh i mean we use some strange pedals and uh in, in things uh, the one of the halos on this uh we uh Rosan had made this little box that he, he had taken an eight track player that just the wheels of it and and put two screws in it and and use different springs across it and when you turn manually turn the head of what would have been the eight track cartridge it rubs up against the, the spring and depending on which spring we put on it and the tension it just makes this guttural uh vibration and then when you run that like through one of my pedal boards and stuff uh, it creates this strangely orchestral but really dark uh, sound, uh, you know, and it's under a couple of those. And if you take something that's got a, a kind of a clean, poppy uh, chord progression, but then you have this this thing that's not specifically a... a natural sounding yeah and it's not a chord it's just it's just a tone that kind of changes uh that's not major or minor and really kind of screws with the what, what your ear is hearing so um uh, we like doing that that there will always even if a song is beautiful there's going to be a um an underlying chaos in it for sure like the thing we were recording last night uh you know got to have some pretty screwed up guitar stuff with uh, a couple bizarre pedals and and i don't often use a, a whammy pedal but we were able to to track some stuff in in some strange harmonies with that and doing the the swells and stuff with that so 
it's it's whatever it, it I, I love taking a guitar and not making it sound like a a straight guitar right sure. I always love hearing stories of what people used in the studios that was like maybe unconventional, you know, like with the, the springs on an, an old eight track and everything to create that sound. Because uh, I heard the story recently from uh, oh, the singer of uh, Collective Soul when they were doing, oh, shoot, I can't, but is there, yeah, he did that through a uh, toilet paper tube to get that, that airiness of the vocal sound that he just couldn't get any other way no effects that they could think of to do it so he just put his you know through a paper tube on the uh on the in the studio and yeah and that was I mean, it yeah that's that that's cool that's being you know everything now is so easy by pulling a plug-in down you know yeah. you get uh and you go back to some of the earlier recordings and you had to work at that there wasn't that so you had to be you know, the early Beatles stuff with George Martin and then Roy Thomas Baker and, uh, you know, Brian Eno and stuff. That was like you had to figure workarounds to, to create something that wasn't there before. So as simple as taking a, a toilet paper tube and doing that, that's, uh, you know, that's fantastic. There, there is probably a plug in you can pull down and and and, and change and you know just eq oh, sure. something down like that but but doing it that way is i think so much more rewarding in the end you it's definitely have to be a lot too. more creative and uh that's something that again we talk about going back to the classics the old stuff there's just such a certain charm even though like we have modern day plugins and stuff like that it almost makes a lot of today's music extremely sanitary like you take a listen to any of the radio stations and a lot of these artists you can't tell them apart because all the shit sounds the same, but there's something about the certain quality and a charm of some under underproduced stuff. Well, not like produced in writing, but under the way that they were just put out. Like, say, I'm a huge fan of Catatonia. Listening to their stuff now when it's produced by people like Jens Bogren as opposed to going back into the day and hearing some of the uh, the rawness of it. It's like, wow, that is so cool. Well, there's, I just, there's certainly an honesty of doing it when you don't have all this stuff at your disposal you have to you have to work harder uh and now if everybody has the waves bundle or something that they just pull down the same vocal chain and everybody's you know people that are using like guitar process not process just the the plugins and the you know someone creates a patch and this ir and it's like guitar sounds and things are all every it's it's hard to to separate yourself from that and i think the human ear starts hearing the sameness in it and uh i think that's why you know there's very little plugins on the the music that we do it's uh you know it it well, may, maybe I would be different if I was doing this by myself, where it's like, well, I don't have time to go put do a multi mic setup on this. I don't have time to mic the amp. It's I'm engineering. I'm doing this. I'll I'll just pull. I'll just go directly in with a Kemper. But having Rosan going, let's try this. Let's do this. Let's do two cabinets. Let's separate it by this. And you know, we're able to kind of work at at the sounds that are not out the box and mm -hmm. i mean we're certainly not reinventing the wheel but i know that it is my guitar plugged into whatever combo of pedals i decided to you know lay go together at that point and uh at least we work for it uh right i mean i'm not gonna lie i am guilty of doing that my uh my number one go-to plugin is stl tones whether it be control hub or tone hub but what i really like about that is it's it's producer based and uh you can get a lot of really good sounds right off the bat but you can go in and change the mic position change the mic that you're using change the pedals and all that so you you can get into the wheelhouse of being close to what other people are doing but still change it up yeah, I, make I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not shitting on that whole process. Oh, You're doing it oh. yourself. And if I was sitting there without having a producer slash engineer doing that kind of busy work that I just don't have the patience for or anymore, I would do the mm -hmm. exact same thing. You oh, know? And I, 
I'm not taking a dig at you either, because honestly, if I had that kind of stuff, if I had access and time to that kind of stuff, I would 100% be doing that myself. And it's just, it's, it's a wonderful time to be a guitarist, especially in today's day and age, because you have so many options that you can go for, but being able to actually mic up, a, like mic up a cab, because every time you mic up a cab, you get your own unique sound, even though you may be using the same thing that somebody else used each different variation of said cabinet or amp, or even down to the cable is going to have a certain uniqueness to it. Yeah. I, I think I, I, jump back to when we we were first starting to do the first record and i think i i i think act you know, again sometimes you know being president of Schechter has its benefits so i think someone they had sent us an axifax and i think a kemper uh so we had both of those in my head going we were starting to do this record i'm just like well how this is going to be easy just to you know plugged this in and everything and i sat down with Rosan. we had both things and he patched them in and we did a couple of parts and he's like that sounds good and all now let's plug into uh you know the supro and put your pedals so we did it i kind of played the same part and when we started stacking stuff there was just no comparison to the amp uh sound it just something all the process stuff seemed to just disappear in in the mix and kind of stay one dimensional uh he thankfully that's that's his mo and he he loves that part so we just have continued i think right. maybe there's one or two things that ended up having uh, over the past couple of records that the camper part stayed on maybe it was just like putting an idea down in something I just played on the spur of the moment that I was never able to recreate, like the feel of it that we just kept. But for the mm -hmm. most part, it, it, it is miking up and, and yeah, it's a, for, for this record, I certainly looked, you know, I I'm, I'm an average guitar player and I have no notions that I'm, you know, I don't sit and want to practice, scales and gymnastics and that's just not where i cut my teeth but i you know i was looking for new sparks and you know i find that in new pedals like plug into something and it mm -hmm. makes me play something and it's like okay here's something i recorded settings and we, we we work on it from there i also dove into some alternate tunings for this album because i think i found myself you know, playing this sameness, like going, here's this progression or here's these chords together. And it's like, well, shit, kind of done that. Uh, but finding things that uh, spark something by just the tuning, uh, you know, not even knowing what chord I was playing, just fingering and going, okay, that's kind of cool. And, you know, bringing that in, like I said, he's got the theory. So I'm going, okay. You know, I was excited to bring a song in, and it not only was an alternate tuning, he looked back at me, and I had a capo on the third fret, and it just like, he's like, <laughs> wow. And so I, I played something, and goes, that's really cool. We play that first chord, and he sat there, and he goes to the piano, it's like, ding, ding, uh, uh, that's a B minor seventh with a 13th on the top or something. I'm just like, <laughs> just going, but the other side of it is like, yeah, fuck you. Now, <laughs> that scary man, I'll throw this. <laughs> but yeah, so there are a few of the songs. I think Devil You Know is is definitely in a, a at least a, the, the, uh, the verse stuff is, I think, a, a, a different tuning with a capo. And it was kind of interesting doing parts that are tuned like that and then going back and maybe playing the chorus in a standard e-tuning and stuff and making it work. Now, like you say that you find inspiration like pedals and everything too. What's the absolute craziest pedal that you've plugged into and messed around with and ended up finding something usable? later on for a typically unusable kind of pedal shit we've got a few of them i know we really i uh i love the walrus audio lore uh that got used quite a bit on on this record uh the hologram microcosm uh i think is featured pretty heavily uh 
on one of the halos. Uh, one thing we always end up using quite a bit, and it, it for some reason it just recently died, but thankfully we got everything we needed, is the uh, Electroharmonics Mel 9, which does sort oh, nice. of the, the Chamberlain and orchestral stuff like that. Uh, we, we were going to add it. We wanted one more part on a halo, and some reason it is now stuck on one one of the 10 different programs. And I looked online. It's like, yeah, this is a known thing, but I, I just bought another one. But, yeah, so those, those are pedals. I mean, I, I get them, and then I'll, I'll find myself going, well, well, shit, now I have like eight new things here. Uh, and I'll, I'll, pull, I'll, I'll sit with something and go, you know, before I really dive into it, if, is it intuitive? Like if I just spin some knobs, do I feel like something's going to come from this, however crazy? And if it is, then I'll put it in a little pile and go, we'll get back to this. And after a while, I'll go through some of the old ones and going, we've used this to for enough. Uh, it's not inspiring. And then I'll off it and get something new. To me, it's just like a painter. You know, if you have just primary colors and then suddenly you walk into a, a art store and going, oh, there's metallics, there's, you know, there's these kind of strange colors and there's this and that. I think it's just something else. I mean, wherever you get your inspiration from, whatever set, sends down a path to create something, I'm all for. Now, switching gears into that inspiration stuff, I got to say, every time I pick up one of the Schecters, either... Either model. I, I've got a few here. Every time I pick up one of those, it's like, this is the vibe that I get from this guitar. Ooh, I like feeling the vibe on this guitar. I like, it's just some some stuff you get inspiration for. Like, I, I have a discontinued Hellraiser V1 all in white. And uh, that thing, it has like the best clean tones out of all of them. And I've got a couple of decent guitars I could use for clean, but God. I just got to say, like yeah. each each guitar has a different vibe, and just like with your pedals, I'm like, oh, yeah, pick yeah. it back up, like, yeah. let's go. Probably hate this, uh, but I I don't find the guitar at least the way I play in in how uh, how how much other stuff is put on it. The guitar isn't as important to me. Uh, I mean, I have quite a few. I mean, I think we have like six or eight guitars sitting in the studio. I have uh like an old stargazer that has a sustainiac i i had added to it with a bixby so that gets used quite a bit for that stuff uh you know i have a couple of the corsairs uh i i do have some oddball stuff you know we used the devil you know has one of our hellcat base sixes on it a lot. Oh, I, doubled a, I doubled a lot of the lines with that. And I think one other song, maybe it was Hollow, that the bass six got used quite a bit on. Uh, but then there's some other oddball stuff in there. I have a couple of weird Eastwood guitars that are kind of cheap, but I have a Warren Ellis Mandocello uh, that I think on the last record spurred the track Orion. Uh, I have a Viet. Uh, like a a short scale twelve string like baritone thing that created a song. So they're cheap enough that I sit there and go, "That's kind of interesting." I get it, and then I write something, and it's like, "Okay, that that suited its purpose." Uh, mm -hmm. but most of this record ends up going back to one of the two Corsairs that's sitting in there. I have a custom shop solo six. Uh, that has the Lundgren pickups that any of the heaviest stuff was probably with that. Uh, I have a, a couple of PTs uh, that were in weird tunings. We even had uh, one of the PTs strung in, uh, I don't know if it's considered Nashville tuning, but it's taking, like if you had a 12 string and just the high strings of, of that, and I had the guitar strung that way. So there's some textures that are strummed with that just being the high strings of a 12 string. Uh, and I think I have a Corsair 12 that's on some of the stuff. So I, I'm not, I, I think if the guitar, if the sounds were more straight, like, you know, guitar amp 
with not much in between. The guitar, you know, guitars certainly have a a sonic quality that's different, but I think with what we put on them, it, it lessens the fact and it's more of the the vibe. Uh, you know, mm. I'll, I'll pick up something and if it's working, it doesn't matter which Corsair it is or something like that, unless he's like, it needs to be brighter and then we'll pull something with single coils or tap or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess what I was coming from was uh, each guitar, like even if it's just a different color, it adds a different like, hey, I'm feeling down. Let's pick up the black one and uh, write something opathy or hey, yeah, what, you know, what, whatever. I feel just grab the red Hellraiser. Whatever, yeah. whatever that that spark is, you know, there there are no rules, and that's one thing I love about Beauty and Chaos is. You know, we threw the rules out the window. Every now and then we'll put a a box around us. Like the first album was, I was adamant there was going to be no keyboards. So there's not one press a key, make a sound. And there are a lot of textures. There's ebos, there's actually violin bow, there's uh, sustain pedals, there's weird stuff. Uh, the Mel 9 is a lot all over that record where people go on, oh, of course there's a keyboard. It's like, you know, <laughs> my parents' life, there's not a keyboard on that. So that was a, a kind of a, a box that we, we put around the making of that record. And uh, I think I was asked in a, a recent interview, like, you know, someone picked up on that and they said, well, what, what's next? Uh, what, what's the next box you're going to put yourself in? And I think, and I think Rosan was actually on the interview, which was, is rare to get the guy in front of a camera. But I think I said, maybe next time the next, we start doing a new record, we bring our pro tools, we bring up 24 tracks and that's the template that we, we work within trying to treat, Pro, a digital recording DAW as a 24 track tape machine, like working in, in those confines that, you mm -hmm. know, if you're going to put something, it, it, you're going to add, it's the part has to be key or it has to, you know, if you decide we're going to add a, a tambourine, maybe it can go in the guitar solo track, you know, cause it's not happening, but, but mm -hmm. looking at it as that, you know, I guess, again, looking back to the, the way we used to work, but going back and treating it like a tape machine, not just going right. more layers. Here's, here's 80 tracks of, you know, uh, of this. Uh, it's like trying to go minimalist on the track, like trying to be uh, conservative on the tracking, but getting more creative. Of what yeah, you have maybe a it's again, sometimes uh, limits can be a creative uh, outlet and, it's just something I was thinking about whether we sit there and, and do it and go, and this is sucking uh, and abandon it. But I usually don't abandon my first idea. It's, there's usually some reason that it, it entered my brain and we'll usually see it through. So that might be. You got to go with your gut, right? Yeah. We, it's, it's worked more, you know, often than not on Beauty and Chaos and what we've done at Schechter. All right. Awesome. Now, I, th I think it's no surprise. I'm a huge Schecter stan. I absolutely adore the company. Um, this guy has seen the collection. I I also love Schecter guitars. They are my yeah. favorites. Thank you, guys. So, like, and gotta, I'm not kissing ass. Like, I'm I'm legit yeah. serious. <laughs> so, and I, I gotta throw out a couple of questions on there. Sure. On I'll, that. Just, I'll just add this here. It, you know, I I'm blessed that this is my day job. I could be doing something else, a construction worker, and would suck. You know, I happen to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, I was a kid. I always, I love the idea of guitars, uh, but it, do, it does turn to be a job. You know, I have, I think we have 58 employees now and I, I do have to make the right business decisions to keep everyone employed. And I do have an owner to answer to, uh, you know, that God bless the, the gentleman. Uh, he trusts me. Uh, to, to run this, there is zero input or oversight. Uh, I'm just fortunate that we make more right decisions than wrong decisions. That he he allows me to run this as a as my own company and as a small company to where we can see a trend, try to get in get in on it, 
ahead of the time, hopefully. And if it's not working, get out of it. It's uh, right. We, it's not turning an aircraft carrier. We can we can be nimble, and I think that's been uh, a positive part. I think that most people at Schechter are musicians, so I think artists pick up on that. It's not they don't come over and there's a boardroom. They come over and some of these pedals I'm talking to you about are all over my office floor and stuff like <laughs> that. So I think they get the vibe that this is something different, and it's it's been a good doing Beauty and Chaos has been a good thing for for me as president of Schechter. I mean, you when when something that you love suddenly becomes something that you're selling to feed your family. I'll break it down to that, that it's our, it's my job. It's how I get a paycheck. It, it's hard for something not to be just become a widget. And there were times that I started going, you know, look, we'll come up with something. I'll go, great, not my cup of tea, but someone else, they'll, they'll buy it. And I, I hated that. And uh, I fought with that for a couple of years that maybe my interest in what we were doing started shifting to more would it sell as opposed to is it cool and is there a need for it and do I love it? And I think starting to do Beauty and Chaos in 28, I mean, uh, 2018, start, it kind of reignited my love of the instrument, uh, mm -hmm. pedals, the things, playing the guitar, kind of things that we designed and, and bringing them in the studio and using it. So it, it certainly, it was a, a spark. And I, I'm, I'm really grateful that's, that's there because I do now enjoy going back to work and sitting and working on concepts with, you know, the cool team I've put together. And it's, it, it, it's exciting again to see a prototype coming in and going, that's really cool. We can do this with it or I'd play that. Uh, so that's my yeah, a couple of, a couple of things I want to throw out there is first of all, it's really cool that even though as you are the CEO president of Schechter, you're still selfless enough to push other artists ahead. Like you don't see Beauty and Chaos plastered all over the Schechter page. No, that's really not. cool that you're you're a real one. And on top of that, you don't make Schechter like Gibson or Fender a lifestyle brand, which is absolutely trash. Like you take a look at some of these guitars. They're coming through. Quality issues are just absolutely terrible. They play like dog shit. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take the stand and say a lot of these, a lot of them play like absolute dog shit. So that really is a testament to the quality control and the team at Schechter. You run a really, really tight ship, and it's it's really really cool over there. And you guys uh, talking about the trends. There's a couple of things out there that I would personally really want to give a try, like the uh, Sunset Triad. That thing, that thing looks so cool. See, that, Three pickups and a when I was a kid, they had a Mighty Might pickup uh, called the Mother Bucker, which was a three-coil pickup. <laughs> and uh, nothing ever really happened with it. It was always something in my head that that's kind of cool. I mean, I always love, you know, doing a guitar that's versatile, that, that mm. can do multiple sounds, uh, even weird I mean, we have a, there's a prototype or a couple hanging in the office. I don't know if it has a name yet. I think we were calling it the, the, the double triple or something. And I don't know if that'll stick, but it's a C-shaped guitar with two of those triple coil pickups in it. So this guitar mm. has six coils in it. Uh, is it gimmicky? Yeah. You look at it and go, okay, wow, that's, that's crazy. It must be really loud. I mean, no I, I, I gotta see that. No <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's gimmicky. Is it fun to play? Is that that's what right. matters? Like, you know, that's gonna be hot as hell. We're trying to figure out the right wiring, what to do with those six coils. Uh, I mean, granted, you'd never put them all on at once. It's just mud. Uh, oh, but, but finding weird combinations like this coil with the middle and then the far bridge. I mean, I I love scooped sounds that just kind of carve its way into a mix or something so th that's that's going to be interesting uh it, it looks really cool because i think one of the guitars is black with cream binding so the the hums go like black cream black uh it's mm. so i mean part of 
you know, behind the curtain, part of things with this is one coming up with a cool name, you know, that's half the battle. You know, I mean, how, how uh, most metal kids, you go Hellraiser are going to go, that's a cool guitar. Then you got to yeah. make, make the guitar live up to what that is. I mean, we get ideas from the weirdest points. You know, sometimes it is a name that sparks something. Sometimes it's a finish that'll lead down to something. Sometimes it's just a, what I find is a need or a, a niche. You know, Schechter... The thing that makes this so interesting to me is that we're across the board, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not Jackson, BC Rich, or Dean, and no knock on those brands. They came around the same time Schechter did, but they are kind of pigeonholed in a way to what it's right. supposed to be. Schechter for right. good or bad, because coming from that replacement part background and, and thing, things – you know, replacing things on Gibson and Fenders. There's not much we do that looks like fish out of water. Not a lot of brands will, will do a six-string fretless bass and then have a nine-string Hellraiser, you know. Right. Uh, it's kind of bizarre, you know. I look at it as like if you owned a music store and you had our brand in there, that was all you carried, you pretty much could – suffice any customer that came through the door you know right you guys have a you guys have a wide variety of different style of guitars yeah. that's and we have a wide variety of uh bands not a lot of people not a lot of brands will have a both and then the cure you know right. on, the, yeah. on the same roster and it we're actually going to be playing with a both's uh bass player here in uh what is it august uh the band's name is nervosa uh yeah very cool is it, but, uh, uh, what's her, is it the girl? Uh, yeah, yep. Okay, Mia? Yeah. I, I believe so. Like, uh, all of Nervosa is completely female front. Like, okay. it's all female. And, uh, yeah. They like, fucking shred. Yeah, they do. <laughs> but, no, like, with Schechter, you guys you guys have such a wide range of artists, too. And uh, even, like you said, you, you guys are willing to take a shot out of the dark, try something new, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You guys are pretty good at taking stuff on the chin. Yeah, like, uh, some it, yeah, you, you know, I, I'm I'm not stupid. I knew doing that MGK guitar was going to get us a ton of flack, and I, I'm like, fuck it. I mean, seriously, it, that, 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 that guitar, you know, like I would get emails going. I can't believe the president of Schecter is promoting self harm, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, we do That's so much. And we don't ever run it up the flagpole for kids, pets, and vets. Self harm? No. If that, that's if, ridiculous. If Gene Simmons is promoting deforestation with the axe base or something, I mean, it, it's like no, I, I, didn't, just, I didn't take a look at the uh, razor blade and think, oh wow, that's promoting self harm. I'm taking a look at that and thinking, okay, this that that looks eighties as fuck right now. Yeah, so, if you yeah. got there and had a line of coke on the table and laid that there, that. <laughs> Than what the 80s band would have did. I mean, right. I mean, like, even is supposed to be fun. And I think mm -hmm. people are so freaking triggered and look for a reason oh. now about something. And rock and roll is fun. And, uh, right. you know, like, it's I mean, fun and it's absurd. Take yeah. a look at one of the uh, one of the artists, signature artists that you guys have now, like uh, Kenny Hickey with Typo Negative. If, they, if a lot of people, if they really wanted to get triggered, Go listen to that first album, Slow, Deep, and Hard. I have a hoodie with that that says uh, Express Yourself. It's got the gun, the razor blade. Uh, and I can't remember the other two drugs on one side, and it says Express I mean, Yourself. That band and it's like, has the, the greatest sense of humor. I have one of the T-shirts, yeah. Four Dicks from Brooklyn. I mean, that, <laughs> that band was built on being uh, making fun of themselves, you know, and they're one of the heaviest bands ever. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I don't. Get it. Right everybody, there, everybody has an opinion, and you know, you can like Machine Gun Kelly stuff, or you can hate it. The guy at least put some guitar visibility in front of somebody, kids that maybe would not have picked up guitar. Mm -hmm. And he had our album. He had our guitar in the cover of two albums that actually sold physical cap copies over a million you know mm -hmm. they say there's no bad press 
and and I've met the guy a couple of times. He's not a he's not a tool bag. He's actually was grateful, and I he picked up guitars and can actually play. He he took lessons from Sinister Gates before. You know, uh, I I, right, well, I, 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 you I don't guys, read most of that shit. You know, it's just like we we do what we do. I know it comes from an honest standpoint. Uh, every everything we do, everyone's not gonna like. Uh, and that that's okay. There's there's plenty of other good guitar brands. I don't mock anything else like that. You know, we do what we do. Uh, I know our stuff gets copied, but I look at other stuff too and go, that's kind of cool. How do we incorporate that? No one's reinventing the wheel here. You know, if you're no. still looking at playing a a fifty fifty eight Les Paul or a sixty three Strat. You know, a lot of the the creativity has been done. Most guitar players don't really want to change that. I mean, no. players are actually more uh, open to to strange wood combinations and in bizarre shapes. But for the most part, when we do an odd shaped guitar, it 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 doesn't really stick around. You know, there is a comfort factor and and things like that. You know, that's mm-hmm. why our C shaped guitar is still our most most popular not my night cup of tea but we've dressed it up you know a hundred different ways mm-hmm. yeah the i super would say the c-shape is uh you know it's 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 kind of schecter's um oh shoot what's the word i'm looking for uh signature signature shape you know gibson has the Les paul fender has the, the stratocaster schecter has the c-shape you know it's distinguishable from other brands yeah, right. I'm just it's circle back it, here, and, and, and it, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, it's it, it it's become a staple. I mean, we have our our shapes that we we dress up and and kind of change. But I mean, Schecter does do great strats and tellies. I mean, that was the the where this company started, and when I was kind of handed the reins to this, I really separated ourselves from it i didn't want to be that that's where the tempest the hellcat the avenger were the first three new shapes i threw at and then i i realized that you know that that's schecter's heritage you know everybody does a strat shaped guitar you know and we did them we do them real well uh so it, it's certainly not going, we're copying Fender, but Leo Fender got something extremely right with that and the Telecaster. Mm-hmm. Well, and yeah, then and even I later mean, with G&L guitars, I mean, he went and, yeah. you know, re- innovated again. <laughs> and I'm going to circle back around. I'm going to throw this out there. Like, even when you messaged me and you're like, so you're not a fan of the MGK. And I'm like, you know, it's not personally for me, but you take it on the chin. It's not like uh, you get butt hurt when someone's like, hey, you know, it's not for me, but... uh the PT though, even the PT, I, I love the color that pink PT that he's got. That thing's dope. I, I'm a sucker for pink. And uh, going back to typo negative, you guys actually got the whole typo fan base kind of up in a tizzy a few years back when he came out with the uh, new solo design for Kenny. Because right around that time, uh, Roadrunner was hyping up something that they were about to release for typo, and then that guitar came out, and I'm like, oh shit. Is something is something happening? Is there going to be like a reunion, like what I they're doing with? The I, don't know, I don't know how you put a put someone to replace Peter. Uh, I mean, we were fortunate. I mean, when we were going attending Nam, we've had some pretty infamous Schecter parties that always have had a had one of our name bands play. And uh, the last time we did it, I think it was right before. Uh, they closed the, the House of Blues at Disney. Our last, that's where we were doing the parties. And the last one had typo negative and it was Ooh. off the hook. And, and kind of have, we went to dinner the night before and, and everybody, Pete, uh, Kenny, Josh, and Johnny Kelly were there. And they, they just constantly fuck with people, you know, just like I just didn't listen to conversations and people like just, like this, like hook, and I'm going, you know, I think it was Josh sitting there telling somebody, yeah, we're breaking up after this show. It's done. It's done. And and these people are like, really? And I'm just going, they're just fucking with people. And it, it, it's so great that that's uh, 
what they were and getting the hang a little bit with Peter. Pretty pretty nice guy. And if if you get past the whole image and and reading the song titles, I mean, they were musically pretty fuck. I mean, there's elements of the Beatles in their stuff. Yeah. It's just they did a medley, uh, Day Tripper medley. Yeah. That was a uh, straight up Beatles. And uh, I know they were fucking with a lot of people around that time because that was like what about right around the time Dead Again came out, and uh, there was a lot of internal turmoil on the band because I think the problem is why rehab. But, but I mean, that band would if they came out now, they would be so canceled, uh, uh, you know, which is fantastic. <laughs> Right, like I still go back. Just the other day, I listened to uh, "We Hate Everyone," and I'm like, "Man, that's so great." <laughs> but uh, like, yeah, you, you, I'm just gonna say this: you guys got everybody excited when we saw that big, ugly green solo come out, and we're like, "Oh shit, what's gonna happen?" Are they did they like recruit Villa Velo, or do they have someone like Jerky Sixty Nine come in to fill in from the Sixty Nine Eyes? Because those are the only two people I could think of that would actually do a decent job of paying tribute to Peter. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a, a family squabble, you know, over things like that. Uh, I mean, we, we still uh, talk quite a bit with Kenny, and uh, I think he's tried to separate himself and, and, you know, not just live in that shadow. But, I mean, mm -hmm. there deserves to be a tribute uh, to that band. Um yeah, didn't they just uh, doing with Bill Ward? I heard, I read something that they went into the studio with Bill Ward to uh, record a tribute to Peter. Yeah, I don't know if that ever saw the light of day. Ugh. But God damn, I'll try to find out and let you know. Yeah, no, just it seems like all the cool bands and just tying this back around all still seem to come around and like. I'm sitting here, I'm like, wow, that dude plays Schechter. I love that band. Or, wow, yep, there's a reason why I love Schechter. It's just they're everywhere, and they're great quality, great bang for the buck. It's hard to come, like, even the lower end, like, Omens and stuff like that. And when I mean lower end, like, lower on the price range, they're just good guitars, man. You guys are awesome, and I love that. And uh, seeing that the guy who runs the company uses them in his own personal group, um, like you said, you got, like, five or six Corsairs, and uh, a bunch of different, a bunch of different ones like the Hellcat and stuff like that. It's nice to see that you, uh, you, you lead by example, but you don't put like you don't self insert and make yourself the yeah, face. I'm not gonna that. ever make, uh, you know, it. It's not about that. I, I love that I do it, and I love that everybody, you know, the people at Schecter that do have bands. I think, you know, you, you're better at your job if you, if you use what you sell. Or if you just if if you just play if you're you're in the realm of it, you know I think that's that's something that was in the beginning as it was I mean hell when I took over I think we had four people and it's just kind of I mean we caught kind of lightning in the bottle it was the right time uh, that ninety seven ninety eight period where Jerry from Papa Roach and then. Uh, Power Man oh, from Thousand and Terry Corso from Alien Ant Farm and the Demon Ant again, right? Yeah, and you know yeah. one one thing I love about our company is that those guys are part of the family. And Adema may not sell many records anymore, but they still play. And when they come by, they're treated like family. They're not like ah, eh, you're you're done. We we move on. We're sinister gates. You know, it's like. One, once you're kind of part, it's like the, the mafia. It's hard to get out. <laughs> right. And, you know, you, you do kind of feel like tying into this. Like, even on the uh, the Schechter page, you guys are pretty responsive and getting back to people. It does feel like a family. I mean, yeah, we do rib each other in the comment section here and there. But, like, having somebody who's virtually a nobody that you have no idea who exists, like, reach out and like start a conversation and talk and the fact that you take the time out of your day to reach like reach back out and say something I mean, that does reinforce that hey i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep voting with my dollar and spending it here because these guys give a fuck i, I mean I've, all, I've always felt like Schechter is a company for the player you care about us as a player and a customer and you want us to keep coming back and you guys do that so well with your mm -hmm. All your products are amazing. All well, the guitars. I've never played a bad checker. 
I appreciate that. I, I think we have a, a really good person in, in customer service. Uh, it's hard. You know, people, some people are just assholes. And there are some people you're not going to please no matter what you do. And I hate when something gets to the point that he just, he'll, he'll send me the thing and I'll go, okay. And he'll just have to write, maybe we're just not for you. Like there are just some people, you know, and thankfully it's one in 10,000 that you're just not going to make happy. Uh, but just the fact that you have that 10,000 coming to you, that's that says more than it should. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I it's not lost on me that guitars have gotten way more expensive. You know, I sat and looked back. Uh, I have a book on my desk that has when we used to do the print catalogs. Uh, and I was just summing through it the other day. And I look back at our C1 Classic, which was a C-shaped guitar. It was neck through. Had, and it had the tree of life on it, right? On the front. So, abalone everywhere, gaudy as hell. Uh, Seymour <laughs> Duncan gold pickup. So, everything that is expensive to make. And I, I kept a price list in the you know behind it. And that guitar was $9.99. And I sat there going, if we did that guitar today with all that, it would probably be almost double. And wow. that that's just how you know the. The, the dollar versus whatever currency in, in Korea, uh, you know, I mean, the guitar industry does kind of chase cheaper labor. Thankfully, we've built our brand on that mid to upper mid price point, you know, mm -hmm. not really trying to do here's a, you know, 199 Chinese built guitar, but they things are getting more expensive. And I, I do commiserate when people are like well shit that guitar it's like we're not trying to rape or pillage anyone you know it's just right. it's just how this has turned uh you know but so the one thing we've always tried to do is go you know is if we have to have a model or credo uh is is that don't remove yourself from being the person on the other side to counter you know, treat mm -hmm. somebody how you'd want to be treated if you walked into anything and wanted to purchase something. Try to, you know, try to answer their questions. Try to make what, you know, the setup guys. It's like, hey, try to, that guitar leaves your desk. Try to make it one you would buy, you know, that you wouldn't feel. And, you know, stuff gets through, gets through that shouldn't every now and then. You know, some guy may have a bad day. In, in setup, hungover or something, maybe that guitar gets in the market. You know, stuff does happen in shipping. I mean, it does leave our place. Sometimes ship to Sweetwater's warehouse in the middle of the country or to uh, American Music Supply completely across the country. You know, I've seen FedEx just heave boxes and it's like, hell, you know, no matter what we do, to that, now it's at the mercy of, you know, it it traveling, you know, 3,000 miles to the East Coast. And we're responsible at the end of the day. I, it, if it ends up to a, a kid who spent their hard-earned money, and then I get the, I can't believe Schechter sent me this, you know, and you look at it and it's got a crack in the neck pocket or something. It's like, fuck. It's like, I know the guitar didn't leave here that way, you know, but... No. But yeah. your guys' customer service has got to be like the top, one of the best in the game, though. So I mean, with we, we like, try, back you know, we definitely issues, try. You guys, you guys definitely don't leave anybody hanging, and the only people that are left hanging are the ones that gave them just enough rope to hang themselves with. Because you guys go out of your way, out of your way. Like there's been times where I've been on the customer service end of it, and I'm like, "Hey guys, can you do something for me?" And no issue. And it's it's stuff. It's not necessarily stuff that's wrong with the guitars or anything. It's stuff like you know, hey, pot, pot, I want to I want to refurbish. Pots go bad and stuff. Switches go bad. You know they. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone on an import guitar uses import Asian electronics. Some are better than others. Some pot will will just go bad. You know you're not going to be able to put, you know. Fifty dollars of CTS pots in a guitar you're trying to sell for six ninety nine. It just 
the dollars and cents don't add up. So it's always mm -hmm. trying to make, trying to deliver the best possible product that we can, you know? And you guys do one hell of a great job and, you know, kind of uh, reaching the end towards the podcast here. We kind of sure. set them up around an hour to an hour and a half. But I mean, <laughs> circling back around, I'm just going to end it with this. Fucking Schachter's, I like the Voices in My Head podcast. There's uh, four musicians in this group. Three of us own Schachter's. That should say something. So having someone like you on here not just promoting the brand, but also being able to talk about your own band, Beauty and Chaos. This mm -hmm. has been a... This is a huge deal the, for us. Yeah, try not to fangirl out a little bit. What we're to, what's up with the first guy? guy? What's he play? <laughs> He's, a, He's drummer. a drummer, so... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're going to get into that well. I was trying to look at what Corsair I had here. One second, I'm off screen for a second. Uh, <laughs> no, your elbow's still on screen. <laughs> yeah, you're still here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think this was a uh, a black one, or maybe this was a gold top that I just had a burst painted on it that maybe I used in some video. But that's this one. Oh, it's got a strange tuning here too. C uh -oh. sharp, C sharp, G sharp, C sharp, F, G sharp, C sharp. I don't know what I got out of that, but <laughs> there was a reason behind doing that at some point. <laughs> if we're doing show and tell. I'll pull out my favorite and uh Dustin, we don't have time. time for your show and tell with all your guitars. Oh. <laughs> there, there was a time where I, I absolutely absolutely adore this guitar. Saw you guys put it out. I made a couple of memes, it picked up traction. A couple like a bunch of people were sending me memes, so I'm just tagging you guys in it for like the summer of twenty nineteen. It was the solo apocalypse too. Finally got my hands on one. Absolutely love it. Yeah, that was. Uh, I'm really proud of that pickup. We worked. That, that has oh. an apocalypse in it, right? Yes. Oh my god, I love the apocalypse pickups. I want to put these in like all the EMG ones that I have. But this fantastic guitar, absolutely adore it. Plays great. And it's in a new I, music uh, video coming out, right? Uh, it's in one of the music videos that we had uh, for Rituals. Oh, that's um, right. The the music video that we have is actually uh, SLS Evil Twin Avenger. Nice. It, it it seems in the guitar world that it passive pickups and actives kind of ebb and flow as far as popularity. I I I don't I don't think I own any guitars with active pickups in it. Uh, it's never been my my thing. Uh, you know, I mean, Fishman's and EMGs are fantastic. I think. I think one of the bases in the studio uh, has EMGs with the, the full EQ, but it's just, you know, hard. To, you know, for guys like that play like you, 81 to 85 is a great mm -hmm. combination. The Fishman's, I mean, I love the Lundgren pickups. Like the, the M6 is, is a fantastic passive pickup, but the Apocalypse is great too. We work oh, really yeah. hard on the design of that. But uh, those those were those were a straight up knockout and uh i i can't say anything better about them i i shoot man i'd be happy to see them putting more models honestly yeah like maybe the, the san andreas pickup is really good too and that's not in enough but again those are two things that started with a name like hey the apocalypse sounds like a good pickup name now let's design a pickup that has the visual and the sound that you would install expect mm -hmm. from something that says that so we do things from a sometimes a, a very bizarre uh point but but it works but you know i appreciate you guys taking time and i appreciate you certainly listening to the album uh i hope i made sense when uh, how i tied in how that that has been a really good thing for me to be i i view Schechter the past six years I've been doing this differently than maybe I did the previous two before that. I think everybody, you can hit a burnout place uh, oh, on, oh, what yeah. you're, on what you're doing, you know, and uh, it definitely reignited my love of the instrument. And uh, I think everybody at Schechter kind of, kind of saw it you know i uh oh, it, it definitely shows with all the uh, new promotions and stuff the new uh guitars coming out it's really great to see see that beauty and chaos has had such a reinvigorating take on Schecter as a brand itself and yeah, the and fact that, that, that you're just excited 
that's in all honesty. That's not like a sales pitch. I, 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 I do know that is what, and I, at least I feel like I can admit that I, I hit, hit the wall and I was looking at things, uh, for a bit where it like there wasn't that excitement that way I was as a kid looking at instruments, you know, and, uh, there is that now. And there's, uh, the R and D board, uh, is kind of chock full with things that are coming in that, I mean, we have a, a completely new redesigned Hellcat guitar, uh, that's, uh, pr pretty cool. Uh, you know, that really, I mean, the retro stuff, it, it, I really like. there's a new TSH in the works, but then, you know, we balance it with the, the heavy stuff. There's a, you'll, you'll probably, there's some pretty cool metal top, guitars coming out that have fantastic etched art in them uh we've Ooh. we've working with a uh a uk artist team uh on those designs and hopefully those get to the to market soon you know i think everybody guitar companies now in that post-covid world uh where during covid it was just about getting stock in because people were buying guitars that you know, if they just wanted to play, it's like, oh, I got nothing but time. I used to play in high school and they were just buying everything. And we, our business went through the roof because we didn't, a lot of companies kind of canceled orders and went, this is going to kill us. We need to scale down. And we were just like, yeah, Chapman, <laughs> pedal down, full fly at the wall. Uh, and it, it worked out for us. And now, now it's back that we're past that, that it's now back to being, having to be creative and trying to get a step ahead of, you know, your competition. And, and I enjoy, I enjoy that challenge. And I'm part of me is, you know, one that this, that whole COVID bullshits behind us, uh, oh. the idea of actually, uh, having to being creative again is, is, is cool. Absolutely, man. And hey, just so you know, I'll never stop sending you guys design ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Always look, man. So, so yeah, please do. I know that uh, me and Dustin have talked to about doing a sexy Schechter photo shoot. So maybe expect <laughs> uh, some uh, risque pictures of Dustin and his guitars. In your hoping that we so, out bad like hot girlfriends or wives that y'all were going to get in that. I'm not sure about the two of you. <laughs> I, no, I do have a wife, a gorgeous wife that model has modeled one of the bases before. I'm going to do a two bears, one guitar photo shoot. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that has all kind of horrible connotations. Oh no! Don't listen to him. We can use it in all the Schecter advertising from here on out. <laughs> William, I appreciate you. We liked uh, "Echoes in the Angels." That's a uh, that's a very cool song to me on 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 that on the album. Uh, Leo was fantastic on that. Yeah. Wait, there is a video of that, and uh, she'll she'll like the video. Uh, it's like I had to get uh, do a video with a singer who's made a little over half my age. And uh, had his shirt unbuttoned and a six pack and a, a good looking guy, and I had to get the video with him. So, I mean, hell, that was hard enough when we did the the video with Doug Pennick, who Doug pulls his shirt off, and that guy's seventy and has a six pack. It's like, how the hell do you do this? And <laughs> kind of like J.K. Simmons and Danny Elfman, man, those guys are ripped. It's like, Jeez, or, I, I know it's a hot button issue, or we could even throw out Vince McMahon for that matter. Dude's like almost 80 and he's jacked. Yeah, definitely. You know, if you got the time to work at it. Exactly. Yeah. I don't got that kind of time. I'll put the time into my hair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I put but it into my I, beard, which you can't really see on my camera. 